Welcome to the MCAT Basics Podcast, brought to you by the physicians at Med School Coach. Each week, Alex Starks breaks down high yield MCAT topics so you can score as high as possible on test day. Hey everyone, welcome to the MCAT Basics Podcast hosted by Med School Coach. My name is Alex Starks, and as you may or may not know, I am taking over Sam Smith, who's off to medical school. I had the pleasure of working with Sam at Med School Coach for a little over a year, and I'm sure going to miss that guy, but he's on to bigger and better things, so good for him. I also realized I didn't introduce myself much in our last episode. You might be thinking, who the heck is this guy? So a little bit about me and my MCAT background. I've been teaching, tutoring, and creating content for the MCAT for about six years now, and I've kept a really close eye on how the test has evolved, and I actually recertified my own score last year, so rest assured I'm not, not out of touch. So today's episode, we're going to be reviewing a really important topic, that being biosignaling. So we'll be discussing biosignaling conceptually, then we'll move on to the mechanisms that are important for the MCAT to know, and then we'll wrap up with a little quiz about what we talked about. No, we won't be talking about all of the different types of biosignals that exist because one, science hasn't discovered them all, that's a good reason, and then two, uh, most of this you'll learn, like the nitty gritty of it, you'll learn in medical school. If you're familiar with the AAMC content outline, most of this information is covered under 3A, which, quote, focuses on the structure and functions of the nervous and endocrine systems and the ways the systems work together to coordinate the responses of other body systems to both external and internal stimuli, end quote. So that's a lot. Now, something that's really important to know is that the MCAT really rewards students that understand the idea of there's a stimulus, some internal processing that has to occur, and then there's some sort of response. So this not only means things like the classic fight or flight example of you see a bear, your brain says, oh shit, and then the sympathetic nervous response allows you to think quickly and run faster after it sort of you know, reroutes the blood supply to your brain and your muscles. So it's not just that. It also includes examples like blood glucose homeostasis, puberty, apoptosis, and in general transcription regulation. So the specific topics I'm going to focus on today are gated ion channels, including both voltage-gated and ligand-gated, receptor-linked enzymes, and then G-protein-coupled receptors. So voltage-gated ion channels are a type of transmembrane protein that form transmembrane channels that ions pass through, either extracellular to intracellular or vice versa. So they're activated by changes in the electrical membrane potential in close proximity to the channel. So think about the last time you you stuck a knife into the outlet when you were a kid and you got zapped. You moved, you physically moved and changed your body position. It's the same idea here when these channels essentially get, get zapped, which would be like a change in the electrical membrane potential around it, then they, they, they change, they change conformation so that they form this channel that allows these ions to pass through. This is also why during a neuronal action potential, the voltage-gated sodium channels open sequentially from the hillock all the way down to the terminal. It's not like there's an action potential that's initiated right at the hillock and then immediately at the end of the terminal, we also have a, uh, a channel opening. It takes a little bit of time to get there. One other important thing to note is that these channels are usually unique to a specific ion. For example, a sodium channel will not allow calcium ions to move through it. I'm going to ask you why this is the case at the end in our little quiz. So other common channels that you should be aware of include potassium, chloride, and even protons, which travel in the form of hydronium. Now we're going to zoom into the molecular level of what's going on with these voltage-gated ion channels. So this change in the cell membrane potential near an ion channel triggers that conformational shift, which is again like sticking your knife into the outlet when you're a kid and like jumping up and being shocked. And that conformational shift in that protein adopts a shape that allows ions to pass through. I think of it as like a big water slide that opens and connects the extra and intracellular environments. So like when they're open, specific ions move down their concentration gradient, which generates an electric current that further depolarizes the cellular membrane. So in a neuronal axon, the depolarization due to one channel opening will be in close enough proximity to depolarize its neighbor ion channel, which changes conformation, allows the ions to go down the slip and slide, which then depolarizes the local cell membrane around it and helps to depolarize its neighbor, and so on and so forth. 
So we're not going to get into the specifics of the action potential and when the various gated voltage gated and leak channels open and close. That's another time. But I do want to mention what happens at the end of an action potential once the depolarization reaches the terminal. Calcium channels are going to open instead of sodium channels. And this triggers a sequence of events that allows the neuron to release its message to the next player in this giant game of telephone. The signal is different now. It's not electric, it's chemical in the form of a neurotransmitter. And the target can be either a neuron or a different structure like a gland or a muscle. So this brings us to the second type of biosignaling we'll be talking about, ligand-gated ion channels. So ligand-gated ion channels are also known as ionotropic receptors, which is just a fancy way of describing a cell receptor for a neurotransmitter whose action is mediated by ion channels, which means the neurotransmitter binds the receptor and then an ion channel in probably the close vicinity is going to open. Now be careful not to confuse this with inotropic, which is something specific to muscle cells and not really MCAT material. So don't worry about it. That'll be medical school. All right. So the example that I want to use as a vehicle to explore this concept with is going to be a neuron to neuron interaction. We've just discussed that a neurotransmitter is released into a synapse. So let's pretend that neurotransmitter is a monoamine like GABA or glutamate. It can be it can be that simple. So the neurotransmitter will travel through the synapse to bind with an ionotropic channel that ex is expressed in the dendritic region of the cell membrane. And this will open an ion channel, again, in close vicinity to it, allowing specific ions to flow down their concentration, which allows a specific ion to flow down its concentration gradient. Pretty vanilla so far. Now, something that I think is really interesting is that the ion channel opening can result in excitation or inhibition. It's kind of like when your friends or family are trying to decide on which restaurant to eat at. Someone says Olive Garden, and the yeses are excitatory signals, characterized by positive ions flowing into the cell, and the no way Jose's are inhibitory signals that are from chloride ion channels opening. Now, of course, in this example, nobody really wants to go to Olive Garden, so the inhibitory signals would win out and there would be no net depolarization, meaning we wouldn't then have the electrical action potential at the hillock. This process in the neurons is termed graded potential instead of action potential because it's not an all or none process. The inhibitory and excitatory ions that move into the cell due to ligand binding sort of compete and only if enough excitation occurs will there be enough excitation for that action potential to occur. Another example that you should know about, and it should help with this understanding, and is also very interesting, is how acetylcholine works in muscle contraction. So let's consider skeletal muscle. So the motor neuron releases acetylcholine as a chemical message at the neuromuscular junction. So the acetylcholine binds to nicotinic acetylcholine receptors, which allow sodium ions to flow into the muscle cell through its, its transport. And if enough of this occurs, contraction occurs. If not enough happens, like if you are simply willing yourself to get off the couch and open your MCAT books, there isn't enough excitation to actually get your muscles moving. As a side note, a common misconception and a fantastic trap answer for the MCAT is that calcium ions flow into the muscle cell when acetylcholine binds, but that's wrong. Calcium plays a role later on, but it doesn't really leave or enter the muscle cell. It's the sodium that causes that initial depolarization. A couple of questions at the end will include what happens when we add certain drugs that interact with receptors, neurotransmitters, etc. simply because this is a double AMC favorite. The next thing we're going to talk about are enzyme-linked receptors. They're also known as catalytic receptors. Now there are a lot of different, a lot of different enzyme-linked receptors in the body, and it's not entirely clear what the double AMC will test on since thus far the practice questions released focus on only the idea of enzyme-linked receptors. We'll talk about them in generally, and then I'll include one example that I think would be the only one that could really possibly be tested. So an enzyme-linked receptor is generally a transmembrane receptor with only one transmembrane domain, and the mechanism of action proceeds by the binding of an extracellular ligand to the extracellular portion of the receptor protein, which induces a conformational change, and this ultimately allows the intracellular portion of the receptor protein to catalyze some sort of reaction. Think of these as a broad class of receptors that all share general characteristics as I described. And also keep in mind that the effect or the result of this process is incredibly diverse. Maybe 
the message or the mechanism of action inhibits a cell uh, process or it's more excitatory and activates a cell process. They're just be very mentally flexible if uh, this comes up in a passage or something. One type of these enzyme-linked receptors are the receptor tyrosine kinases. And as of this recording, we have discovered 20 different classes that contain multiple different families within the class. And you know, what's kind of cool and kind of a connection to cellular biology is a lot of these different receptors are simply isoforms, so they've gone through alternative splicing. But there are a lot of different genes for these different receptor tyrosine kinases, so just a fun fact. The good news for us is that a receptor tyrosine kinase, which I will now call an RTK, does exactly what its name suggests. Thank you, biology. So it's a receptor that acts as a kinase and phosphorylates tyrosine. So the not so good news is that it's obviously more complicated than that. So as an enzyme-linked receptor, an RTK will have an extracellular region that binds whatever ligand matches the binding site. It's often growth factors, hormones, or cytokines. I'll ask you something about this at the end in our little quiz. So, now as you can imagine, these types of ligands often produce really powerful changes in protein expression, so much so that these signaling pathways are often implicated in cancer. The RTK also has an intermembrane region and an intracellular domain that propagates the signal inside of the cell. All right, now we're gonna zoom in a bit and talk about the mechanism of action for the classic RTK. I should note that like all things in biology, again, tremendous variation, but this is how I really do think that you would see it on the MCAT. So, after ligand binding to the extracellular domain, two monomeric RTK proteins will dimerize to form a two subunit RTK. Now it's not quite active yet. It still requires phosphorylation intracellularly. And now this is a really interesting process because it involves autophosphorylation, which is absolutely a tournament concept you have to know for the MCAT. So autophosphorylation simply means that these RTK subunits phosphorylate itself. The auto prefix gives that away. And this should make sense after all because RTKs are kinases and they just dimerized. So maybe they will act on each other. Now this phosphorylated active RTK dimer is what we call a relay protein. It's called a relay protein because it's going to no surprise, relay the message that the extracellular ligand was bringing to the cell to other proteins intracellularly. So these other proteins inside of the cell are so diverse, I'm not gonna name any specific ones, but I want you to imagine a bunch of inactive proteins hanging out, just floating around the cell membrane, waiting for a job, waiting to be called into action. And this RTK does just that. So once activated, these proteins go on to activate other proteins and processes that essentially constitute the cellular response to the instructions that the ligand provided. So this is a very simplified explanation of what one class of RDK does. And I want to emphasize that it's not certain that this is required content knowledge when walking into your MCAT. I would imagine that you would see a passage about an RTK and then knowledge about what an RTK is and what it does would be really helpful. However, there would probably also be enough passage clues so that the savvy test taker can still stumble into the correct answer. Now we're going to talk about the G protein pathway, which is a moderate yield topic that can be tested in many ways, including its petty and pedantic details, which I personally find obnoxious, but it's, it's not my test, so we just have to play by the rules. So anyways, the G protein is short for guanosine nucleotide binding protein. And it almost always associates with a G protein coupled receptor or GPCR that lives in the cell membrane. Like the RTK, there is an extracellular binding domain, an intermembrane domain, and an intracellular domain. Unlike the RTK, the intermembrane domain is not a single helix. It's comprised of seven membrane-spanning helices. The signals that are mediated via this protein and pathway are incredibly diverse. They respond to insulin. Some respond to monoamines like dopamine, serotonin, like opioids. Like the list goes on and on and on and on. Very generic sort of mechanism. The G protein family that we'll be talking about is the heterotrimeric G protein, which contains alpha, beta, and gamma subunits. The G protein is intracellular and interacts with the seven transmembrane GPCR I mentioned a moment ago. Also of note, that when active, 
the alpha subunit of the G protein is bound to guanosine diphosphate, and when activated, is bound to guanosine triphosphate. I think that's good for anatomy of this process, so now we're going to talk about the mechanism. So first, a ligand binds to the extracellular domain of the GPCR, then the GPCR undergoes a conformational change, which allows it to interact with the heterotrimeric G protein intracellularly, kind of at the, the surface of the cytosolic um, cell membrane. This interaction induces a conformational change to the alpha subunit, and the result, now this is important, the result is that the alpha subunit exchanges a GDP for GTP and is now activated. A very common misconception and like great trap answer that the MCAT would love to hammer you on is that the idea of GTP being phosphorylated to create GTP instead of being swapped. Don't make that mistake. Easy points. All right, so once the GTP is on board the alpha subunit, it dissociates from the beta and GABA subunit. And I remember this by thinking that, you know, alpha is going to go be alpha and wants to go and do the lone wolf thing. And beta and gamma are too timid to be alone, so they stick together as a heterodimer. So what's important to also know is that both the alpha and the beta gamma subunits are activated at this point, and they both interact with different effector proteins, which help to amount a cellular response to the message sent by the ligand binding. I think we're starting to see a, see a theme here. Just like a lot of what we've been talking about, there are so many variations on what happens uh, through this pathway, and the proteins that are involved are also very diverse. But I'm going to limit our discussion on what you need to know to get points on test day. So knowing that the beta gamma dimer has an effector protein should be sufficient. But you need to know a little bit more about what the alpha subunit does. So once dissociated, the alpha subunit, still bound to GTP, will sort of drift over and meet up with a protein called adenylate cyclase. Now you might be thinking, give me a break, another protein I have to know, but thankfully its name gives it away. So adenylate cyclase cyclizes adenosine triphosphate, or ATP, into AMP, well, cyclic AMP, and a pyrophosphate. As a, a fun fact, pyrophosphate is just two inorganic phosphate molecules that are bonded together. And you should also make note that CAMP, or CAMP, is a secondary messenger. Now something you might be thinking is, how does this stop? Are we going to have this signaling pathway go on and on and on, and we just keep creating more proteins and all that kind of stuff? Well, the answer is no. It has to stop at some point. So like everything, there are a lot of steps and things that are involved, but let's just imagine the cellular response is sufficient. Like we've accomplished whatever job that we need to do. There are other proteins or other signals that have told us we did a good job, it's time to rest. What happens is that alpha subunit of the G protein hydrolyzes, it has an intrinsic hydrolysis ability, and it hydrolyzes that GTP into GDP, and essentially this allows the alpha subunit and the beta gamma subunits to come back together in their inactive state. One last thing I think you should simply be aware of is that signals through the G protein can be inhibitory or activating. And this should make sense because cells in the body in general need to be able to fine-tune responses. And in the case of the uh, cyclic AMP generation I described earlier, if it's an inhibitory G protein signal, the G protein will act to prevent adenylate cyclase from creating CMP. And this basically dampens certain cellular responses so that we can stay in that little Goldilocks range that the, the body loves so much. All right, so this is the content that you need to know about biosignaling for the MCAT. We're going to do some of these quiz questions. And this is something kind of new for the podcast, so if you don't like it, please let me know. Or if you do like it, also please let me know. All right, question one. So earlier I mentioned that ion channels were very specific for a specific ion, and different ions usually can't move through that same channel. So my question is, why do you think this is the case? And the example will be, why can potassium ion channels move potassium, but not sodium? All right, I'll give you just a few seconds, but if you want to think about it, you might want to pause. All right, so the answer to why a potassium channel can move potassium ions, but cannot move sodium ions, is essentially the size of the ions. 
It's not the charge in this case, that happens in other scenarios, but not here. Now it might seem counterintuitive that a potassium transporter can't also transport sodium, because potassium is actually significantly larger than sodium. I can talk about angstroms, but that is probably just too much. So that might seem odd, and we could go into the different angstrom size of the ions, but just take my word for it, potassium is significantly larger. So the reason why we can't also transport something smaller is that the amino acids that line the opening of the potassium transporter, called the selectivity filter, has binding sites that would place the sodium too far away. They actually happen to be oxygen atoms, and of course the, the sodium and the potassium would be attracted to the lone pairs on these, on these oxygens, but the sodium just can't get close enough. But the sodium is just too small to interact with those lone pairs. But it's perfect to accommodate the potassium's larger size. Now the charge thing is probably easier to understand. The atoms of the amino acids at the openings and within these, these channels that would bind like a chloride transporter would be positively charged, or at least have a pretty decent uh, partial positive charge. So maybe they're like the basic amino acids. And of course, if there are basic amino acids attracting chloride to go through this transporter, they're going to repel anything that has a positive charge like potassium, sodium, or, or calcium. All right, question two is multiple choice. So I mentioned earlier that the MCAT loves to ask questions about the effects of certain drugs that act on receptors or neuro neurotransmitters themselves. In fact, the majority of drugs that you'll prescribe to your patients when you're a doctor are going to target G protein coupled receptors in, in one way or another. So let's consider Bob. Bob has hypertension, which is high blood pressure. He also has adrenal gland hypoplasia, which means his adrenal glands are pathologically small and pretty much inactive. So high blood pressure and a broken adrenal gland. So the question is, which of the following interventions do you think would be the best for Bob? A, installation of a pacemaker. B, administration of a vasopressin receptor antagonist. C, administration of an angiotensin 1 receptor antagonist. Or D, administration of acetylcholine esterase inhibitor. So a pacemaker for A, B is a vasopressin receptor antagonist, C is an angiotensin receptor antagonist, and D is an acetylcholine esterase inhibitor. We'll give you just a moment to think about it. If you want a little more time, just press pause. All right, the answer is B. So high blood pressure is almost always due to high blood volume and that's regulated by the kidney. So the best thing to do for Bob would be to get his kidneys to reabsorb less fluid, allowing more blood volume essentially to leave as urine. So we could administer a diuretic, or we could block the signaling of two hormones which promote the reabsorption of fluid in the nephron, those being aldosterone and vasopressin. Now, you might have caught on that B and C act in these respective pathways. So angiotensin receptor antagonist would, would be implicated in the aldosterone signaling pathway, and vasopressin, of course, is vasopressin, also known as antidiuretic hormone, by the way. So we need to think, though, the patient's adrenal glands are broken. So there's no sense in trying to block the angiotensin 1 receptor because it's unlikely that aldosterone would be the culprit here anyways, since the adrenal glands aren't working. So we're left with blocking the receptor for vasopressin, which acts on the collecting ducts of the nephron to promote more aquaporin insertion into the membrane and uh, you know, subsequent reabsorption of water, allowing for more water to be absorbed back into the body from the filtrate. All right, question three. So earlier we briefly discussed that as an enzyme-linked receptor, a receptor tyrosine kinase will have an extracellular region that binds whatever ligand matches its binding site, often growth hormones, fat, different growth factors, or cytokines. So given this information, what types of ligands would we expect an RTK or a GPCR for that matter to have? It's not multiple choice, so just take a second and kind of brainstorm what sort of ligands you think 
All right, time is up. So we would expect the ligands to be happy in the extracellular environment, like they would need to be, which means they need to be hydrophilic, which would lead us to think peptides and some monoamine hormones. This is an extremely important concept to have mastered by test A. So cholesterol, terpene derivatives are not going to interact with RTKs or GPCRs because they are not happy in the extracellular environment. All right, well, that's what I've got for today. I'll leave you with what I feel is probably the most important takeaway from the content we talked about today. And that is whenever anything at all happens with a cell in an organism, it's because some sort of signal was received by the cell, the signal instructions were processed, and a cellular response was mounted. All right, thank you for listening. As always, comments and feedback are always welcome. Until next time. Each episode of MCAT Basics is brought to you by Med School Coach. To access Med School Coach services, including MCAT tutoring and medical school admissions advising, visit our website at medschoolcoach.com. Good luck as you prepare for the MCAT, and we hope you tune in again next time.